Hello, my name is Dr. Anton Ilderton. I am a lecturer in theoretical physics in the Center for Mathematical Sciences. In this talk, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to some topics in the mathematical modeling of how infections spread, and in particular concepts such as R0 and herd immunity, which I'm sure you've heard about on the news. The tools for understanding this material in depth are taught in my second year course on ordinary differential equations, or ODEs for short. These are equations which tell us how one quantity changes as we vary another quantity, often time. You may not have encountered ODEs yet, so let me give you an example which will be useful below. Shown on the slide is the ordinary differential equation for radioactive nuclear decay. So let n be the number of radioactive nuclei in a sample of material. d by dt on the left hand side means the rate of change with respect to time. So what this equation tells us is that the rate of change of the number of nuclei in the sample is equal to the number in the sample itself multiplied by minus lambda. Lambda is just some number which determines the half-life of the material. Now the solution to this ODE is given by an exponential decay curve. So the number of radioactive nuclei in the sample at time t is given by the initial number multiplied by an exponential factor. This is an exponential decay curve, so the number of nuclei is falling and it falls because of the minus sign in our equation, which you can see highlighted here. So this just tells us that the rate of change is negative. This will be useful later on. Now, ODEs are a cornerstone of applied mathematics, fundamental physics, and models of infection spread, to which we now turn. So an infection is spreading in a population. We divide this population into three parts, S, I, and R. S is the fraction of the population who are susceptible to infection, i.e. those who have not yet been infected. I is the fraction of the population who are infected, and R is the fraction of the population who have contracted and recovered from the infection. Now, every member of the population is in either S or I or R. We also assume that once recovered, people have developed immunity and cannot be reinfected. So under those assumptions, the equations of this model are shown on the left of the slide. Now, a point of notation, rather than writing out d by dt all the time for rates of change, we abbreviate this to a dot over a, barrier, over a variable. So s dot means ds by dt, or the rate of change of s. Okay, so let's look at our three equations. The first equation tells us that the rate of change of s is always negative because of the minus sign. This is because the fraction of people in s decreases as more become infected. In other words, people are moving from group S to group I. The rate at which this occurs depends on some number beta. It depends on S itself, because the more people who are available to become infected, the quicker the infection can spread. And it depends on I, the number of infected, because of course, the more infected there are, the quicker the infection is spread. The second equation, tells us how the number of infected changes with time. There are two terms corresponding to people moving from S into I and then from I into R as they recover. Depending on the relative size of these two terms, the number of infected might rise or fall. The final equation tells us that the rate of change in a number of recovered is of course proportional to the number of infected. And also that R can only increase because its rate of change is positive. There are no minus signs here. This rate is controlled by some number gamma, which can be measured from patient data. Now this is the SIR model of infection spread, and it has been particularly successful in describing how measles and chickenpox spread in a population. So now let's start working with these equations. Our first result comes from simply adding all of the equations together. 
If I do this, then on the left hand side, I get s dot plus i dot plus r dot. And if I add all the right hand sides together, I get zero. All of these terms cancel each other out. In other words, the rate of change of s plus i plus r is zero. So s plus i plus r is not changing. It must be a constant. And this is natural and consistent. Because s, i, and r are fractions of the population, they must sum up to give the entire population. In other words, they must sum to one, a constant. So now let's turn to the key quantity, which is the number of infected i. Here is the equation for i again. From the right-hand side, we factor out i times gamma, leaving this equation. And we define r naught to be the ratio of beta over gamma. Now, this is an important quantity, and this is the r naught which you have heard about on the news. You can think of it as the number of new infections caused by any single infected member of the population. So the quantity in blue in our brackets here is just R0s minus 1. Now, because s is a fraction of the population, it is less than 1, which means that R0s minus 1 is less than R0 minus 1. This is an important inequality because it immediately allows us to distinguish two cases which rel relate to our current situation. If R0 is less than 1, then this combination which appears in our equation is less than 0. It is negative. In other words, the rate of change of I is negative, which means that the number of infected is just falling off. It decreases and it decreases to zero. So the infection dies out on its own. Good. However, if our zero is larger than one, then the combination R zero S minus one, which appears in our equation, can be either negative or positive, which means the number of infected can both decrease and increase. And in this case, we have a genuine epidemic. This is, of course, the situation that we find ourselves in with COVID-19. Suppose then that R0 is larger than 1. How do we force the number of infections to go down? I.e., how do we end the epidemic? How do we make I dot negative? Well, social distancing, as we're currently experiencing, reduces the number beta in our equations and therefore it reduces r naught. Vaccination reduces the effective size of S. It shifts people from group S to group R without them picking up the infection and therefore it makes this key combination r0 S minus 1 smaller. And this is one way of achieving what is called herd immunity. From the equations, we see that when S has decreased to one over R zero or less, then we have I dot is less than zero. And the infections start to fall. What this means is that eventually so many people have become infected and then developed an immunity that the virus can no longer spread easily in the population and hence infections start to fall off. Another way of achieving herd immunity is just to let the infection spread. Because as it does, S always decreases. Note from this equation, the minus sign, which tells us that the rate of change of S is negative. So S is decreasing. So the question to ask is, is it a good idea to let the virus spread and aim for herd immunity that way? Well, some estimates put the R naught of COVID-19 at around about three. So to achieve herd immunity, we need S to be less than one third, which means either vaccinating two thirds of the population, and we don't have a vaccine yet, or letting two thirds of the population contract the virus and develop immunity. And that would clearly have huge social implications.
Now let's turn to what happens at the end of the infection. So after some time, the number of infected does go to zero and the epidemic ends. Now one can use something called a stability analysis to show that this must be the case. But the question that we want to ask here is what happens to S at the end of the epidemic? There are two cases. Suppose the S goes to zero when I goes to zero. What this means is that, is that the entire population has been infected and developed immunity. Hence, no reinfection is ever possible. If this happens, it makes a case for letting the epidemic run through a population and simply burn itself out. Although we have seen from the previous slide on herd immunity that there are social factors to consider with such an approach. Option two, S does not go to zero at the end of the infection. That means that some part of the population remains susceptible. They have no immunity. And so the virus can always begin to spread again if a new infection occurs. In this case, letting the virus burn itself out does not help in the long term. Now to find out which of these situations occurs, we need to solve our equations. Here again are the equations for S and R. We will divide the first equation by the second. So dividing the left-hand sides, gives us ds by dt times dt by dr. Now, contrary to what you may have heard at A-level, it is possible under some circumstances, which apply here, to treat these dt's as if they were numbers and to just cancel them like you would in a fraction. Now, this leaves ds by dr, or the rate of change of s with respect to r. That's from dividing the left-hand sides, if we divide the right hand sides and we find minus R0s, so here's our R naught appearing again. Now this equation has precisely the same form as the radioactivity equation we saw earlier. So we can just write down the solution straight away. Here's the solution in the blue box. It relates the value of S at time T to the value of S at time zero, the initial value of S and to R0 and to R at time T. Now, a subtlety of this solution is that it does not quite describe exponential decay in time because it is R which appears in the exponent, not T. Now, we will ask what happens when a large time has elapsed and the infection has run its course and I is zero. So the number of infected has gone to zero. Well, because S plus I plus R is always equal to one, we know that if the final I is zero, then the final R plus the final S must be equal to one. Here we're writing infinity to denote the final values. So using this result, that the final R plus the final S is one, we can eliminate the final value of R from our solution as such. We can then factorize the exponentials and obtain the relation shown on the left. So this relates the final value of s to the initial value of s and r naught. But what does this mean for the final value of s? Well, let's focus on this last exponential factor highlighted on the slide. Because r0 and s are both greater than or equal to zero, that exponential factor is at least one. So that means we obtain the inequality shown. It means that the final value of s is bounded below by a function of the initial value of s and r naught. Hence, s does not go to zero at the end of the infection. What this means is that in the SIR model, not everyone develops immunity and the infection can always reappear in the future. To summarize, we have from a basic analysis of the SIR equations learned about the importance of the number R naught, which you hear about on the news. We've learned how this defines the proportion of a population which must acquire immunity for herd immunity to be effective. And we found that letting an infection run through a population does not offer complete protection as some part of that population always remains susceptible to reinfection.
And most of what we learned, we learned even without solving the ordinary differential equations of the SIR model. At the bottom of this slide, you can see an example of the typical behavior of S and I and R as functions of time, as can be calculated using numerical methods which are taught in the first and second years of our mathematics degrees. Uh, this plot is for an R naught of about three. You can see that the number of infections, the red curve, first rises and then falls and goes to zero. You can also just see that the number of uninfected or susceptible S does not go to zero, but tends to a finite non-zero value, as we learnt above that it must. So this concludes the talk. I hope you enjoyed this short introduction to the SIR model and to ODEs. Thank you.